Hello there. It's late night on uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, April 12th, 2020. And earlier today, I did an update about DC's homeless and how they're being affected by the coronavirus and the various shutdowns. And because it's Easter Sunday, I decided to do a mini sermon during my update. And I made mention of my favorite verse in the Bible, Isaiah 45, seven. I form light and create darkness. I make good and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. And I talked about how you can't put God into our box of goodness, our box of kindness, our box of love, okay? Because God himself, when introducing himself to King Cyrus said, I form light and create darkness. I make good and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Uh, some versions read, I form light and create darkness. I make peace and create catastrophe. Of course, we're dealing with a catastrophe right now in terms of the coronavirus. And a lot of churchgoers, despite that scripture and despite the many instances in the Bible where God does harsh things, don't want to believe that anything harsh comes from God. One of my uh, favorite Bible stories is the story of Job. And if you know anything about the story of Job, then you know that at the beginning of the story, uh, Satan goes to heaven to chat with God. God says, hey, where have you been? Satan says, I've been to and fro throughout the world beholding the good and the evil. And uh, God says, well, have you beheld my servant Job? And what a good guy he is. He's so upright. I mean, he fears me to the utmost. He, he makes sacrifices for the sins that his children might have committed. He doesn't even know what they've done. But just in case they've upset me, he makes sacrifices on their behalf. And uh, so as the conversation goes on, God and Satan more or less make a bet that Satan can cause Job to curse God to God's face. God takes her up on the bet and uh, God allows Satan to do all kinds of harm to Job, killing most of his loved ones, uh, bringing disease upon him and so forth. And let's jump toward the end of the story in chapter 38. Job has 42 chapters, by the way. But beginning in chapter 38, God jumps into the conversation that uh, Job and his friends were having, and God just more or less takes over the conversation and says what he has to say, because he's God and he can do that. But uh, he starts off saying, who is this that darkeneth counsel, using words without wisdom? And uh, in present day lingo, we might say, or he might have said, speak what you know, you know what you're talking about, then shut the hell up. Uh, and uh, he doesn't say it outright, but he strongly implies that what he allowed to happen to Job was not because Job had done anything wrong. That's what his friends kept telling him. You must have done something wrong for God to do all these things to you. And God indirectly makes the point that uh, he can bring hardship on you just because he wants to test you. He can cause many of your loved ones to die just because he wants to test you. He can cause you to lose all your possessions just because he wants to test you, okay? You don't have to be doing wrong for God to bring hardship on you. And that is the moral of the story. Uh, God is not sweet. God told King Cyrus, I've, I make good and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things, okay? But people hate to think about that. They want to make God out to be some kind of sweet pushover God, a Santa Claus God that gives them everything they want. But that's not the case. So that brings us to Resurrection Sunday, Easter, whatever you want to call it, Passover. Uh, let me stop there for a minute and talk about the Passover. So... Most of you know the story already, how that 
when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, God sent Moses to deliver them and Pharaoh was resistant and 10 plagues were brought upon them. The final one was where they were told, put lamb's blood on your doorpost. If you don't, then when the death angel comes, your firstborn son in each household will die. So the Israelites, the Hebrews, they, they put blood on their doorpost and their firstborn sons lived. The Egyptians didn't, their firstborn sons died. Uh, when Pharaoh's son died, he was in great sorrow and uh, he finally said, okay, get out of here, all you Israelites. Um, of course, later on he changed his mind. He realized he just lost his entire workforce, sent the army out to recapture them. The army got drowned uh, and the nation was more or less left in shambles with no workforce, no military, uh, polluted water. Uh, the houses had been uh, severely damaged by hail that turned to fire and a number of other things that ha had happened. Lo locusts had eaten their crops. But God really left Egypt in shambles when he delivered his people. And uh, my arms get a little tired, so I have to keep changing position here. But that said, God was not nice to Egypt. Uh, and when the Israelites, when the uh, Israelis, whatever you want to call them, celebrate the Passover, they're basically celebrating the fact that God decimated a nation in order to deliver his people. So very recently, I saw something on Facebook where a bunch of Israelis were watching from a distance as the Palestinians got bombed and they were rejoicing. Well, that's consistent with what the Passover is all about, celebrating that the Israelis were delivered while the Egyptians were destroyed. Uh, but once again, God is not sweet. And when he says that he wants to be feared, he does mean that he wants you to be afraid, afraid to offend him. When uh, Aaron and Miriam spoke against Moses, God called them to account and he said, did you not know that Moses is my servant, my prophet? If you knew that, why were you not afraid to speak against him? Why were you not afraid to speak against him? And uh, with all the fierce things God has done, I can't see how fearing God would just mean respect the reverence. It would have to mean to be afraid to offend him. The Bible is chock full of instances where God has done harsh things to those who have offended him. So I don't buy into that watered down definition of uh, what it means to fear God. It just means respect the reverence. You know, these emotional people, the emotional church, they, they want to water things down and make God out to be what they want God to be. That doesn't change who God is. So, let's try to get back to uh, Resurrection Sunday. Um, so, God has a very high and harsh standard. Jesus, during his earthly ministry, said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He didn't specifically say as opposed to God's system. But I believe that those people of his day 2000 years ago who heard him understood it as meaning as opposed to God's harsh system that we're currently under, which was the case at that time. Uh, but that brings us to the mercy seat, which brings us a little closer to the Resurrection Sunday uh, issue that I'm trying to get to here. So the mercy seat was symbolic, as were some other things about the priesthood. But let me jump to at least one other thing about the priesthood that was also symbolic. Now, God's law said that the priest had to sacrifice a lamb at noontime on the north side of the altar. Israel is in the northern hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere, at noontime, the, fat, the, shall, the shadows fall to the north. 
which means that when the lamb got slaughtered in, on the north side of the altar at noontime, the lamb was being slaughtered in the shade. And that was representative of the fact that when Jesus Christ died, a dark cloud overshadowed the land. Um, the mercy seat was also symbolic. Once a year, the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies and apply lamb's blood to the mercy seat. The mercy seat was representative of the throne of Christ. The lamb's blood being sprinkled on the mercy seat was representative of the sacrifice Jesus Christ would have to make in order to earn that throne. Now, some people think that God and Jesus are the same being because he said, I and my father are one. Let's, uh, well, let, let's be sensible here. First of all, uh, there is the weakness of translation. And I firmly believe that if all of the English words that we now have had existed at the time of translation, the words like unity, then it would have read slightly differently. My father and I uh, work in unity, work in tandem, as opposed to I and my father are one. They are not literally one being. The Bible says that a man and his wife become one, but they are not literally one being. Oftentimes they get divorced, so they're obviously not literally one being. But Jesus and God work in tandem with each other. Uh, they have a sense of unity a single sense of direction, but they are not the same being. Now, if they were the same being, there would be no salvation because salvation is being saved from God, not from Satan. I mentioned the story of Job, God and Satan chatting it up, okay? They got something going on. They got some kind of love-hate relationship going on. They work with each other, <laughs> or I should say Satan works for God, but that said, salvation is being saved from God in God's harsh system. So that's, that's why Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, as opposed to uh, what you're dealing with under God's system. So Jesus was earning his throne, his throne being represented by the mercy seat. God does not need to earn his throne. God is already established on his throne. Jesus is the son who was in the process of earning his throne. Now, so let's get that much straight. But, you know, I personally uh, have pretty much given up on the present day church. They don't like to think enough. Uh, they don't like to put two and two together and figure things out the way that God wants us to. And uh, they, they let their own feelings, their own emotions, their own desires determine how they interpret God's word. And they're not even making a real effort to interpret it correctly because their feelings, their emotions get in the way. And sometimes we need a smart atheist to point out the senselessness of what churchgoers say they believe. And uh, atheists have pointed out how that many churchgoers think that God brought himself down to earth as a baby so that he can grow up among his creation and allow his creation to kill him so that he could then raise himself from the dead to forgive the sins that he brought into the world by creating the tree of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil and then casting Satan down to earth to tempt Eve into eating that forbidden fruit and have her tempt Adam, okay? So atheists will oftentimes point out just how senseless what the churchgoers believe really is. And I am saying churchgoers as opposed to Christians because I'm not sure that Jesus Christ would call them Christians. Uh, but anyway, let me see, what, what else is there to consider here? Uh, oh yeah, so there's the grim reality of Easter slash Resurrection Sunday. You see, 
it goes back to what I said about Isaiah 45, 7, that God does good and evil. Uh, and that God is not a sweetheart. Now, when you consider why Jesus Christ had to die, uh, some people believe that he had to die in order for God to forgive sins. And they don't buy into the idea of God setting up a hierarchy, a bureaucracy, that Jesus is a lower level of God, uh, a, a lower God, I should say, God with the lower case G. And they just think that by Jesus dying on the cross, obeying the Father unto, unto death, that God decided to be nice to the world and to forgive everybody uh, and that Jesus is not really going to be some sort of king operating under God on the new earth. But, hey, let, let's follow that, that train of thought for a minute. So Jesus dies to forgive sins. That, that much is granted, okay? But we have, they ask why. Now the Bible tells us without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. We, we would have to assume that that's God's rule. That's God's law. But that raises the question, who made that law? Did God make it because of his bloodthirst? Or is there some concept greater than God that God has to subscribe to. Now, I don't believe there's anything greater than God that God has to subscribe to. Not a living being, not an abstract concept. Okay, some people will say, well, God is so holy, he just can't have sin around him. He's allergic to sin. He'll have a, a, an anaphylactic reaction if sin is around him, okay? Uh, I don't think that's the case. If that were the case, then uh, he'd have a bad reaction to Satan, who, according to the book of Job, visits him quite regularly. But he, he refuses to tolerate sin, and I don't think it's because he's going to have an allergic reaction. I believe it's because he just doesn't want to. He has a very high standard. He, and he is sovereign. And he has determined that he will not tolerate it in his presence. So, if we assume that God is all-powerful, which I do, then we'd have to say that God, of his own free will, of his own desire, decided that he would not tolerate sin. And he, without compulsion, made the rule that without the shedding of blood, he would not forgive sins. So, he is the, orig the originator of that high standard, which created the need for Jesus to die a cruel death because God made the rule. And uh, that would then mean that God is a harsh God. God, without compulsion, without necessity, decided that he would not forgive sin without the shedding of blood. So uh, that means that God is, shall we say, sadistic? <laughs> okay, and uh, we see his sadism in the book of Job. And God was willing to let so many people die just to see whether or not Job would curse him to his face. God is a hard God. In the book of Revelation, it says that the whole world flees at the face of God. And then it says something interesting about our salvation, Jesus Christ. Revelation 19.15 says, Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. For he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. Again, that's Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. Out of his mouth, Jesus Christ, out of the mouth of Jesus Christ go with a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with the rod of iron, for he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. The fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God.
the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. God is not sweet. God has a high and a harsh standard. And God, without compulsion, without necessity, determined that he would create this harsh standard whereby Jesus would have to die on the cross before God would forgive sins. But that brings me back to the story of Job. After Job was tested, after most of his children died, one remaining alive to go and bring the bad news, after most of his servants had died, one remaining alive to bring the bad news, after all his livestock had died, none of them were, remained alive to bring the bad news. But after all that happened, God restored Job and gave him twice as much as what he had before. Uh, I'm sure he still missed the children that died, although God gave him more children. Uh, and uh, God gave him more livestock, more wealth, more of everything. So when Jesus Christ passed the test, then Jesus Christ earned his eternal position. So if you go through what God puts you through and you don't curse God through his face and you do as well as he wants you to do when he puts you to the test, then he will reward you greatly. So that much is true. But look at what you got to go through. Uh, so once again, God is a hard God and the story of Easter or Resurrection Sunday has a very grim uh, element to it because it shows that God has a very hard standard that's very hard to meet. He's not sweet. Love is not his chief attribute. Order seems to be his chief attribute. Order which is largely defined by obedience to him. I've for a long time believed that love is not God's chief attribute. It may be the chief attribute of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ loved the world enough to go through what he went through, but love is not God's chief attribute. God is a hard God and his harsh rules are what led to Jesus Christ having to go through what he went through on the cross. Amen.